left ASAS is low, the left PSAS is high, then it's a flexion disorder. And we need to bring those bones back into place just by tractioning and loosening muscles. So we know the psoas muscle, which we already worked, would be tight. We know the iliacus muscle, which we already worked is tight. And one of the quadriceps, the rectus femoris runs, attaches to the to the ilium and goes down to below the knee. So we know that that muscle will be tight as well. We need to loosen off the SI joints. So when she was face down, we would have worked the ligaments a lot. We would have worked the SI joints, all the soft tissue in there to help uh, release that. And then we would want to use her hamstrings, which attach to the ischial tuberosity, the, the back bottom of the pelvis. And by bringing her leg up like this, and if her hamstrings are tight enough, it will, tr it will traction on her pelvis and bring it back more into extension or out of flexion. Now, if when you loosened off all the soft tissue, things didn't normalize, we need to traction that hip and we need to traction those ileums together. By pushing in on the ASISs, you see how the back opens up? I'm going to put her leg on my shoulder and bring her knee towards her chest. Now, if her hamstrings are tight enough, we're going to get a really nice traction on her pelvis. And notice when I do this, first of all, I usually tell the person to leave their back nice and soft, and their job is just to let their other leg lay on the table. Now, as I pull here, you see her whole leg lifts up on the other side. So what does that tell us, first of all? If it was just her psoas that was tight, she would have lifted and her foot would have stayed just her knee would have come up. But because we see the whole leg come up, we know that it's the rectus femoris on this side that's tight because it goes from the hip to the leg here. But I could also press down on this leg if it really came up. That would give a really nice movement. And actually, as you hold that, it's, it's not in any way, shape, or form a chiropractic move. You're just gently tractioning those bones that are kind of stuck together, and they will just uh, move very, very nicely into position probably 80% of the time on the first try. Now, the next thing we want to do, remember there are three joints in the pelvis. There's the SI joint, the other SI joint, and then there's a joint right at the pubic symphysis. Now, if that is not sitting correctly, and you'll see that on x-rays, I'll maybe put a picture in picture of, of that uh, in, the, in the film. What I'm going to do is have her bring her feet together and bring her knees apart and I'm going to put my elbow and my, my forearm basically between her knees and uh, explain what I want her to do first. I'm going to have her pull her knees together without hurting herself as hard as she can. Go ahead. And did you feel that? Yeah? yeah. Her pubic symphysis just adjusted so it was not in the right place. So that was a real good move. We got it the simple, easy way right away. So we now know that sim pubic symphysis that wasn't sitting right just popped itself back into place. And again, it wasn't a chiropractic adjustment. We just used the adductors, which attach to the left side of the pubic bone and the other ones to the right side of the pubic bone. And by not letting the bones move, she adjusted that herself by tightening those muscles. I thought I had invented that uh, routine, but on YouTube the other day I was looking and I saw somebody uh, teaching uh, birthing mothers uh, a similar exercise to give themselves uh, relief in that area. After I, I did the work on the pelvis to stabilize, I'd have her bring her knees up, I'd have her lift her pelvis up off the table, set it down again, and put her legs down, and now I would measure. Because I may have pushed her into a different position to deceive myself into thinking that I corrected it when really she, when she falls into her natural, comfortable position, it wasn't actually corrected. So that would be the uh, pelvic stabilization routine. Quick refresher. Obliquity is when one ilium has gone in and the other one has gone out, or in flare, out flare. And if you look at these holes, uh, around the ischial tuberosity, you can see that when one goes in, the hole actually looks bigger, and when one goes out, the hole actually looks smaller. So again, I'll put an x-ray picture-in-picture picture on the screen, and you can see what that would look like in real life 
somebody brings you in an x-ray. So what do we do for that? The muscles that are pulling the one, infl the one into inflare would be the iliacus. Although most drawings don't show it, those iliacus fibers, some of them actually cross the SI joint. So they can pull in like this. And on the one that's outflared, it would be more the gluteal muscles that would cause that. On the inflared side, treat the inside of the hip. And on the outflared side, while they were still face down, we would do those glutes. Now, if you remember how we told if it was an inflare outflare, you might see it on the x-ray when someone brings it in, but if you put your fingers on the ASISs and look at how far it is from the inside of the bone to the flesh, and let's say it's two inches on this side, and it's four inches on this side, you know that this bone has very obviously come in. So, in order to correct that, let's pretend that this was the one that was inflared, this one was outflared. Can you just roll to your side a little bit? And about there, that's about two-thirds of the way. Now, the inflared one, I'm going to put my hand on it and just gently traction it that way. And the outflared one, I'm going to put my other hand on it and put my body weight on it and push. And I'm just simply pushing towards the floor and slightly diagonal and rocking a little bit. These temporal, I mean these iliums also talk to the temporal bone, so if we were going to be a little more complicated, we'd also be doing exactly the opposite on our temporal bones and our skull. But and that's all that's involved in uh, correcting that obliquity. And I have a great x-ray, which I'll put up, of a patient who had obliquity. And because she was out of town, we took another x-ray when we were finished working. And you can see the obliquity is completely gone in an hour. Uh, I can't say that that's a typical case, but uh, you can see that you can do some amazing things if you know how to apply these principles and you have the confidence to use them. I had an interesting case with my mother who is now 97 years old. She had pain in her legs and was misdiagnosed with sciatica in my opinion. And when uh, she flew down to Florida and I worked on her, all of the things that usually cause sciatica or typical sciatic symptoms, the pseudosciatica, were all clear turned out it was her kidneys and her bladder. The two sessions, all of the pain in her legs were gone. Now, I don't understand exactly how the organs were causing the pain in her legs, but with two sessions of working on her organs, pain was completely gone from her legs. So, if you can learn to think outside the box and use your imagination, you'll help those people very often that no one else seems to be able to help. Now, very often those kidneys will fire neurological signals into the quadrilateral cymborum. You find people who are in a, in a uh, where their pelvis is, is level and their upper body is going off to one side. There's a scoliotic pattern. And sometimes you'll find that hidden source of proprioception is the kidney that's causing the problem in the QL. The bladder, of course, is right above the pubic bone and in behind it. And in this position, gravity pulls the bladder out in the most accessible position pull from the far side, the lateral side, medial. You want to work the bladder towards the midline and then you want to work it uh, inferior, superior. Okay, we've drawn on the sacrum here in the iliolumbar ligaments and of course there are ligaments right on the sacrum, no muscles, and we need to treat those. They stabilize the SI joint, they stabilize the whole area. So we're going to treat in this sort of a pattern. Now for the sake of the camera, I'm going to go to the other side. And uh, initially you can use this tool and we'll go right in and treat those areas. Uh, depending on how tight the person is, I will usually go right to the precious tool. So now I'm going to go out a half an inch and treat. I'm going to switch over because this tool is actually much more effective. And as you work your way down, you'll feel like right there, there's a tender spot probably, or a tight spot at the very least. And then of course I'll go over. Each row that you work will be progressively shorter because the sacrum is triangular shaped. Okay, and I've drawn in the uh, crest of the ilium here and about an inch 
over from the PSIS, you'll find that ilia lumbar ligament. I'm going to put a little lotion here. It's probably going to smudge everything. And I'm going to go right in. So the spinous processes are here. And I can get right into that ilia lumbar ligament really easily. Of course, if she was very, very sore, I could be using one of the hand tools. But I'm using the best friend tool with the uh, pointed tip on it. Okay, and we're going to treat along the SI joint here, treat all the glutes, the piriformis, and then the tensor fasciolata. First of all, we're just going to warm everything up. Again, I'm using the best friend tool. Now I'll take this very edge. Rather than changing tips, I've learned that I can do most of the work with this one tip. So right now, the only thing that's touching her is this tip right in here. And again, I've got my hands touching her, both of them and stabilizing the tool. Now my body weight is doing all of the work. So I can do that whole SI joint. Obviously I'll get in with a hand tool afterwards. Now I can do all of these gluteal muscles, in various angles again for the sake of the camera. I'll limit the number. I can go down here. Here's the head of her trochanter. Again, I can use just one of these tips and go along the top of her femur, leg bone. I could go right around. If I was to switch and have my body up, uh, up towards her head, I could actually get this in at a little different angle as well. And now we could do all of that. And any trigger points that we find, I could even take this. For example, it's just perfect for getting into that uh, piriformis. very comfortable for your hand. Your fingers are on vacation. I could be using the thumb tool that slips over my tum thumb for this, but uh, I find that these tools that you're seeing me use, I use far more than I use the thumb tools. When I first invented the thumb tools, I used them to do everything that my thumbs did before. Now I found that I find these so much more convenient that uh, there are from select places where I use the thumb tools, but very often I use these T-bars and L-bars far more. Now you could get over into the tensor fasciolata using this tool. We've simulated a low PSAS on the left and a high on the right, and you can see the vertical string and what her spine is doing. It's going over here to the left and then doing a little dance back and her shoulders are definitely not level and she's getting cramps just simulating this so you can imagine the people that you see that come in and actually look like this what they feel like we need to see the tilts lateral and we need to see on a vertical axis the rotations and now we need to see anterior posterior we'll show you that next okay and here we're showing a bilateral flexed ilium meaning that when i put my fingers on the psis and the asis we can see here that she's about 30 degrees and she should be at about 5 to 10 degrees and of course that gives you this deep curve in the back and then it'll usually flatten out the upper back here 